This is Women's Leadership Success Podcast, episode number 105. Do you know why some tasks are energizing and why some suck the life out of you? Have you been trying to focus your energy on fixing what's broken or even fixing your weaknesses? Research shows that when you focus on your strengths, instead of trying to fix your weaknesses, it makes a huge difference in your performance and success. Even in these times of virtual meetings and social distancing, focusing on your strengths and growing them will yield better results in your business, your career, and with your team. Today's guest, one of the leading experts in strength-based leadership, will show you how you can leverage your strengths so you can do things at a higher level and not spend time in energy-draining tasks. Welcome to Women's Leadership Podcast, showing you how to influence people, improve your performance, and advance your career. Brought to you by women's leadership and career expert Sabrina Brom and womensleadershipsuccess.com. Here's your chance to meet women trendsetters leading the way to success, accomplishment, and balance in business and life. No matter if you're a manager, CEO, or entrepreneur, join Sabrina for coaching and no-nonsense advice to improve your career and bottom line. This is Women's Leadership Success .com Radio, and today we're talking to Erin Passens, who is a consultant, coach, and president and founder of Passens Consulting. She spent her career helping business leaders, managers, and employees improve their performance and effectiveness. Um, welcome, Erin. Thank you. Happy to be here. <laughs> and Erin um, was one of the instructors in a, a half-year-long program I did uh, on strengths-based coaching, and she was she was absolutely the best, most incredible person, which was one of the reasons I wanted to have her on the show today. And Erin, you also worked for Gallup. Is that correct? That's right. Yes. And yeah. Th Tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely. And first of all, thank you for your kind words. It's, it's great to be here. Um, yeah. So uh, as you indicated, uh, I've been in the, the business of leadership development and strengths-based coaching for about 17 years. Uh, started that part of my career working for Gallup, um, who of course is long known for their research in uh, not just employee engagement and leadership effectiveness, but also, of course, the Gallup poll, which is what most people know Gallup for, uh, political and public opinion polling. Um, it's actually a pretty small part of their business. And in fact, most of their uh, business is in that management consulting space. So I was with them for about eight and a half years, uh, working with mostly Fortune 500 and Fortune 100 companies to help facilitate uh, leadership effectiveness and really building strengths-based organizations. So I had the pleasure of working with um, a lot of really great kind of household names, name brands, uh, Microsoft, Wells Fargo, Best Buy, um, and really getting an opportunity to see firsthand how Gallup's research can come to life uh, in a consulting capacity. And then about eight years ago, I started my own practice doing very similar work, um, but for more of a variety of organizations. So small to mid-sized companies, some startups, um, still a few big, big Fortune 500 companies, but then also getting able to uh, really build my practice in, in other areas, nonprofit government agencies, and have a chance to work with a little bit more variety now, which I really enjoy. That's great. And you and I know a lot about the strengths um, the strengths leadership style, but a lot of my audience doesn't. And my audience is absolutely wonderful. It's women who are leading in a lot of different countries in the United States and even around the world. And I wonder if you could just give us a little background. What, what is the assessment? And then I'll ask you some more questions about that. Yes, absolutely. Well, I think before I tell you about the assessment, I might want to just share a little bit about kind of the strengths-based approach because I think it's really almost the foundation of uh, where the assessment comes from. And so yes. I think one one thing to keep in mind, and to your point about not all of your audience is familiar with these concepts, I think the reason for that is that many of us spend much of our lives really trying to focus our energy on fixing what's broken. 
fixing our weaknesses and, and thinking about our strengths as sort of, um, you know, kind of a given and let's put minimal energy towards our strengths because we know that those are strong, but let's really put our energy towards fixing what's, what our weaknesses are. And that seems to make logical sense to a lot of people. And what I think Gallup's research and, and others have really found over the last 20 or 30 years uh, in this realm of strengths-based psychology is identifying that people actually grow and develop at a greater rate and in a more impactful way when they spend more energy and time developing their strengths and the things that are naturally easy for them and the things they're naturally good at, as opposed to trying to improve their weaknesses. Um, and so I think Strengths Finder as an assessment tool is really rooted in that philosophy and that science around the value of identifying and clarifying what we're good at and really figuring out strategies as to how we do more of that. That's, that's wonderful. And most of the companies that I have worked in over the last 30 years were based on people's weaknesses and not their strengths. It's, sure. it's so exciting to hear what you're saying. and It, it makes such a difference. So um, what, what, is, what is the philosophy and culture? If, you, if, if, you, if everybody's into strengths, What's that philosophy like and what's that culture like in a company? Yeah, I think a lot of us are familiar with it. And, and sometimes it comes down to just a feeling. Um, I think all of us have had the experience of walking into um, a Trader Joe's, for example. Um, it always seems like a fun place to work. The employees are engaged. They're throwing things around. They're ringing bells. Um, they're energized and excited about what they're doing every day, even working in a grocery store, which may not seem to others like it's that exciting. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that the sort of camaraderie is really a big part of, of what you feel, at least as a consumer in that regard. Um, I think some of the other things that it really impacts is performance. Um, I mean, it may seem like the whole strengths-based approach is sort of interpersonal and maybe a bit more on the soft skills side. Uh, but what I've really observed in my consulting practice and working with clients and leaders and, and organizations is it really makes an impact on efficiency and productivity. Because if you really think about the things that are our natural strengths, and, and honestly, for most of us, especially if we've not yet taken strengths finder or, or identified our strengths, they don't really feel like strengths to us. They just feel like, well, this is just like breathing. I'm just doing what I do. That's not any big deal. But what we don't realize is that those natural patterns of behavior and thought and feeling are actually assets to us. And if we can harness and leverage those things, it really allows us, especially in the workplace, to be able to do things at a higher level of efficiency. And we can all think about things that we've done at work in particular that are just really painful for us, where maybe, gosh, it takes us a couple hours to plod through this process. It's just really painful. And then we watch a colleague next door knock that same thing out in 15 minutes. And we think, what is the difference between my version and her version? But truly, it comes down to, at least in many cases, the level of talent and that person's strengths or aptitude for a certain area. And so I think one of the great benefits in addition to the relationship aspect is really that personal efficiency of getting things done in a more efficient, more effortless way. And the more purposeful you can be about that in a team setting, for example, and this is an area I work a lot with leaders on, is to strategize who's best suited on your team to do what parts of the job that need to get done. So that way you can align and reorganize you know, even just fine tune the way in which people are connected to their job responsibilities that are much more in line with what they naturally do well. So it really has an impact, not just on team morale and engagement, but also on, on productivity, which is really exciting to watch. So are your strengths and your talents the same? Great question. So yes and no. Um, a lot of uh, companies tend to use those, those terms interchangeably, which isn't necessarily wrong. But the way that I like to think about it is our talents are the innate part of our behavior. I almost think of it as almost your, your behavioral DNA, those natural recurring patterns of thought, feeling, behavior. It's the stuff you do automatically. Mm -hmm. Our strengths are our talents applied. So for example, I might have a natural talent. And in fact, one of my top five strengths finder themes is communication, which means it's very effortless for me to translate my thoughts into words. Um, you'll notice on this podcast today that I tend to be a bit long-winded. And, and some of that is just my communication. I tend to think and process out loud. So the talent is my ability to translate thoughts into words. The strength is when I can take that talent and lead a presentation in front of a couple hundred people that's really compelling and inspiring. 
right? The outcome is the strength, the talent or the behavior uh, it is really that talent, if that makes sense. Yes, beautiful. So do people just automatically know what their strengths are or does taking an assessment help to figure that out? Yeah, great question. I think most people know pretty intuitively what they're good at, or at least have a sense of it. Um, so I find that for most people, their strengths finder results are not a huge surprise or anything revolutionary. What I like about the assessment, though, is the language and what it provides, especially in an organizational setting, and even more so with leaders, is it provides sort of a common language across individuals so that I can understand, here are my talents, and here's a sort of a label or a word that I may not have had for that that feeling or that sense that I have in myself of what I'm good at. But then I can also understand what are Sabrina's strengths and talents and how might I be able to adapt or complement uh, her talents and strengths by understanding the language that we are sort of collectively learning more about through the assessment language. And, and that's really where I think a lot of the power comes from is in that interpersonal communication and collaboration component. Right. That's, that's really interesting because when you were Mine are slightly different from yours. Like learners are one of my top ones mm -hmm. and connectedness. So I'm always trying to figure out what, what I can bring to my audience that will help them learn more. So I'm, I'm mm -hmm. studying and learning that all the time. Yes. Communication isn't one of my top five. And the minute you said that, I thought, oh, wow, she has communication up there and I don't. So how did, I, and I know that's not a good idea to be com comparing is but let me ask you is one one person's talents or strengths better than another's or are they just different how I would you explain yeah. that Great, great question. Um, certainly, there's no value, positive or negative, associated with any of the talents. Um, they're all called strengths for a reason, right? And when applied in the right way, they can all lead to highly effective, productive outcomes. Um, so it isn't necessarily a competition about, oh, you've got good ones or she's got bad ones. There aren't any real bad ones, uh, which is great. And I think what, what I really think is powerful about it is that, again, the talent is really the behavior, but each of us as individuals has a choice as how we use our talents, right? So communication to your example, um, yes, I can apply that talent in a, a way to inspire people in a presentation or when I facilitate workshops and that can be a real asset. But perhaps in my personal life, it might become a challenge or a, a downside when I'm maybe not as good of a listener uh, and I'm arguing with my husband and I'm interrupting him because I, I want to get my point across. So the behavior is the same. The talent is the same. But how I apply that is my choice. And I can either use that for a productive and positive benefit, or sometimes it, it runs away with me and I have to kind of manage that. So I often get questions from people around, you know, it would be so interesting to learn what my non-strengths are, my weaknesses are. Maybe it's at the bottom of my strengths finder assessment list. And what I usually remind them of is honestly, our greatest weaknesses or, or challenges are often the dark side or what we sometimes refer to as the raw version of our top talents, mm -hmm. right? It's, um, it's the achiever, for example, who's really great at getting things done, but gosh, sometimes has a hard time turning it off at the end of the night and right. gets home and puts the kids to bed and then pops open their laptop to knock out 10 or 15 more emails. Um, there can be consequences to that level of achievement, even though during the day, it might be really helpful to be efficient with managing your time. So I, so I don't know that anyone is, is better than another, but I do think that certain people can be better at leveraging their talents to get to a more productive outcome more consistently. Right. So um, how does focusing on your strengths affect relationships, performance, team building? Yeah, all of the above, indeed. Oh, just, it, it just helps all those, okay. Yeah, it, it does. I think, you know, it, to me, as a consultant and facilitator, a lot of the work that I do is in the interpersonal dynamics of how strengths work. Mm -hmm. um, I would say in my business, probably 30% of what I do is maybe one-on-one -on -one coaching, so helping a, an individual leader understand his or her strengths and talents to be able to apply them in their role. But Easily 70% of my job is really working with teams or partners, um, interpersonally understanding how do my strengths impact Sabrina's strengths and collectively, how do we get more done in a more efficient way by understanding and, and complementing one another to apply our strengths to a very specific tactical goal. Um, which that's to me where 
uh, the, the strategy of that gets really fun. And I'm, I'm probably speaking out my own talents. I have strategic in, in my top five, number one. Um, so that's something that really engages me is to help people figure out what are you trying to accomplish as part of your role? And how do we help you kind of uh, take your talents and strengths and direct them towards that particular outcome so that you can be really purposeful about how you get those things done? Um, and I think having that common language really does help facilitate better understanding with one another, uh, better relationships, better collaboration. And I think when it comes to conflict and disagreement, what I observe is that a strengths language and a strengths-based approach can allow for uh, us all to provide one another with a bit more grace. Uh, when it comes to not handling something maybe the way that I would handle it. I can see like, okay, gosh, I would really like to get to the point here, but Sabrina's asking a ton of questions, which might be irritating me, but her learner really needs to know. And she's more comfortable and she's at her best when she knows all the things that can be known before she moves forward and take action. And if I have achiever and activator, I'm impatient to take that action. Mm -hmm. But understanding Sabrina's learner helps me to say, you know what, let me just chill out for a little bit because she's in her learner mode and that adds value to us because perhaps she's identifying some minefields or obstacles down the line that I may not be seeing because I'm in such a hurry to get started. So all those unique dynamics can, I think, be really helpful in helping teams work more effectively together. So, uh, so when leaders uh, make this shift to a strength-based organization, what, what changes in the workplace? Gosh, a lot changes. I think um, what I observe, it's almost like a lot of little things. Um, there's a, a, an old adage that many of you listening here today may have heard before, which is in order to change a culture, you have to change the conversations. And I really love that mentality is that culture is not you know, a set of values emblazoned on the wall on a poster that we all create at a corporate level. Culture is everyday interactions. Culture is everyday conversations. It's the way that we value one another. It's the way that we interact in meetings. Uh, it's the way that our leaders uh, set examples in front of other, other team members or each other. And so I think what changes, you know, at least initially, in my experience, isn't anything really dramatic other than just kind of a shared mutual understanding, which then leads to a lot of those little conversations that start to shift. And then ultimately, that leads to increased productivity, increased morale, all those things that we talked about earlier. Um, but it really, the, the specific changes, you know, I, I, I never promise a client that things are going to turn around overnight when you're trying to implement a strengths-based approach. Um, but the incremental changes that sort of accumulate over time really have a powerful impact. Beautiful. Do you think this deepens relationships among your coworkers when you know these things about them? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think what I find, just like I said earlier, with people not necessarily finding their own strengths, find their results to be a huge surprise. I think similarly, when we learn this about others, especially if we work closely with someone, even learning someone else's talents isn't necessarily a surprise because we know from observing them and working with them that it um, can be useful and that, that they have a certain set of talents that are... Um, impactful, maybe even different than mine. But again, adding this common language gives me some strategies or tools to be able to say, okay, you know, this person has relator and empathy and developer in his or her top five, which means that if I'm leading that person, my very first question in each of our one-on-one -on -one meetings is going to be something like, how are you? How are the kids? Hey, I noticed you, I remember you told me you had that soccer game this weekend. How did that go? Really connecting with them on a, on a deeper level. First thing out of my mouth when we have those one-on-ones. Whereas if I'm managing someone else who leads with achiever and focus and responsibility talents, my first question to them is, what are you working on? What's, what's on your plate? How can we help you get more done this week? Right? If I started with the relationship aspect with those achievement-oriented talents, that person's going to look at me sideways and go, um, yeah, I'm fine. Kids are good. Let's get back to business. Right? So I can really tailor my approach, whether I'm a leader or just a team member, to understanding more about how people can get their needs met and what can I do to take ownership of meeting those needs through understanding the language of strengths. Beautiful. Did you know you can change your leadership trajectory? just by understanding your talents and what areas you need to improve? Would you like an easy way to find out where you are in your leadership and career development? 
Here's how you can. I've designed a simple four-minute career and leadership quiz that will help you. And as one of my listeners, you can get it for free. Just, just by going to careerdevelopmentquiz.com. Once you complete the confidential quiz, you'll get your score and suggestions immediately. Plus, you may even qualify for a free coaching session with me. So just go to careerdevelopmentquiz.com and fill out the quick quiz. What I notice when people are using their strengths is they're so energized and excited. And it's interesting to ask somebody, when do you use, for instance, your connectedness strength and what, what gets you excited? Mm-hmm. So that energy around the strengths is, is pretty interesting too. Absolutely. Can you talk about that a little bit. Yeah, no, I'm glad you brought that up because I think that's something that people often get confused when we talk about strengths. They often confuse those with skills or capabilities or even education. And really when we talk about strengths in the Gallup language anyway, it's really more about those innate natural capabilities or, or perspectives. I almost look at it as sort of a, a lens that you view the world through. And so it's less about what can I do because quite honestly, we are all, you know, especially folks listening today in your leadership role, wherever you may be in your career, you're smart and capable and talented and, and hardworking. There really isn't anything that you aren't capable of doing if you put your mind to it and work hard enough. It's the degree to which that activity gives you energy versus that activity drains you of energy. And the more that we put energy towards something, the easier it is, the more effortless it is in terms of our accomplishments, which gets to that level of personal efficiency. And I think the best example that I share in in this case, when we talk about energy, and it's something that a lot of us can relate to, is the idea of networking events. And there are many of us out there listening today who think to yourself, you know what? This is a big part of my job. It helps me further my career. But man, I hate those things, right? They're just absolutely exhausting. And am I capable of going to that monthly networking event that I think is important for my career development? Of course, you're capable of it. Of course, you can work the room. Of course, you can introduce yourself to several people and connect with them. But the degree to which you feel like that was really fun and energizing versus something that you need to go home and, and drink a glass of wine to you know, recoup from that draining experience, that's what we're talking about in terms of energy. And so Gallup has a a talent called Woo, uh, which is really about winning people over and engaging with others in a very effortless and natural way. Uh, It's actually one of my own top five. So I love that kind of stuff, Uh, really meeting new people and hearing their stories. Um, And so Woo's, if you have Woo in your top five talents, you know, it's effortless for you. And in fact, it's an energizer. So my advice to those of you who maybe don't have Woo or find those things exhausting go grab a buddy who has woo in their top five and let them be your wingman or wingwoman at those networking events because they can effortlessly engage people. They don't have any fear of talking to strangers. They can start the introductions. And then you, perhaps with your maybe more one-on-one relationship talents, you can continue that conversation once it's been initiated. But for most people, it's the initiation that can be draining of energy. But once I'm starting to talk to someone and learning about them, okay, I got this now. And so I think it's just finding a way to tailor your approach and identifying through this language what energizes me about my job or my life in general and what are the things that drain me and how can I try to spend as much time as possible in those areas that give me energy and minimize or mitigate those things that maybe drain me a bit of energy over time. Wow, really, it's it's so wonderful and it's so exciting because it offers people the opportunity to really begin to develop themselves in their own unique way. Um, and one of the things I thought was interesting was when you do the, the Clifton Strength Finders, the, the way that you, your top five, let's start with that, they're not going to be the same in the same order as anybody else. You're unique. That's right. The, the chances right. Of, you have, of us having the exact same one is, is pretty low, isn't it? It is. In fact, there's over 33 million different combinations of the top five. 
So that's one thing I really like about StrengthsFinder as opposed to maybe some of the other assessments you all might have taken in your career. So Myers-Briggs, for example, or DISC, um, there are multiple assessments out there. And I think all of them add value in building your self-awareness. What I really like about StrengthsFinder specifically is the notion that there are so many different combinations and that really where the power and magic, as I see it, happens is in the combinations right? So someone with learner like you, Sabrina, if you have learner and connectedness and strategic, your learner operates a little bit differently than someone else who has learner and analytical and deliberative Mm -hmm. because it really is the power of the combinations together that make those talents sort of play out or be manifested in the way that they do. And so even though you might have one or two talents in common with someone you work closely with, your version of those talents might be dramatically different. And that adds kind of a layer of nuance or complexity that I think is really powerful. Right. And, and understanding this and really getting that you are this unique person is a really important reason to not be trying to copy somebody else or be like somebody else. That's There's right. Some, some unique talent that you bring in here. That's right. Erin, what are the uh, common themes or traits you notice in really good leaders? Oh, gosh. Well, I had a, the pleasure when I very first started working at Gallup, uh, gosh, 17 years ago now, one of my very first projects actually was to do some interviews with, uh, I think, about 12 or 15 CEOs of Fortune 500 companies at the time. And what was fascinating is, you know, the study that we were working on was really an attempt to answer that very question of, hey, if we look at 100 CEOs nationwide, would we find some similarities and consistencies in their StrengthsFinder results? And what we found, which is really interesting, certainly in my own 12 or 15 that I talked to, but across the entire study as well, um, there was very little, if any, correlation or consistency of certain CEOs having certain talents. It was all over the map. Some led with competition and achiever and were very sort of assertive to driving towards a goal. Some led with strategic and futuristic and were very creative and thinking about the future possibilities and setting that direction. Others were very relationship focused. They had relator and harmony and really wanted to build a strong team to get to those outcomes. So they were all over the map. But what I would say that they had in common, the most successful ones anyway, was a really clear sense of what they were great at what their strengths were, even if they didn't yet have a language for it, and also really clear about what they were not so great at and what their deficiencies were. And they very smartly built a team around them of people who could sort of shore up those deficiencies and complement or balance out their own weaknesses. And so they didn't try, to your point earlier, they didn't try to be somebody that they were not. They didn't try to do it like the woman next door or the guy across the street in that company. They were their very own true authentic selves in the best way that they knew how and yet recognized that they had some gaps and they needed to kind of build those gaps by hiring a strong team around them. So it was, it was fun to be able to observe that. And I see that play out in all sorts of leaders at all levels um, across different industries is the most successful are just super clear about who they are and who they're not. Great. Can you briefly talk to us about the the do, four domains and what that? Yeah. Means? So so Gallup has as part of their strengths assessment uh, thirty four individual themes. Um, there are thirty four individual talents. So you've heard us talking a little bit about some of those uh, so far today: strategic and achiever and communication and woo. And what Gallup did about ten years ago is actually create four different categories to organize those 34 themes into different buckets or what they call the four domains of strengths-based leadership. And really what those do is help you to understand wherever your talents lie, how do you sort of think about the specific outcome that you tend to achieve more often than not based on where your talents fall in those domains. So the four domains are executing, influencing, relationship building, and strategic thinking. So the executing domain has talents like achiever, responsibility, focus, arranger, restorative. They're all very focused on achieving a very specific goal. So think about that person. If you're out there, I'm sure there's several of you listening where you are energized by rolling up your sleeves and getting stuff done. I like to be busy. I like to have a plan. I like to have my to-do list. Check, check, check. It's very energizing to check those things off that list. Um, So those are the executors and they definitely are the types of people that when you leave a meeting with a team, group of team members, uh, those are the people that are like, okay, so who's doing what? I got this, you got that. They're prioritizing the next steps, right? Those are our executors. They really enjoy getting stuff done. 
Then you've got influencers. Um, these are the folks who are very much about sort of um, very external processors or verbal processors. So they like to convince to persuade, to sell. They like a challenge, like to take the lead. Uh, they like to share their opinions. So they are also very much focused on achieving an outcome. Um, but I like to joke that um, they, they would much rather look to you to get the actual thing done and tell you how to get it done rather than do it themselves necessarily. Mm -hmm. So this is the activator, competition, communication, woo, command, self-assurance, those types of talents. They're very driven to kind of push others to action. So that's influencing. And we've got the relationship building folks. And this is exactly what it sounds like. Um, the talents in this domain are things like relator, developer, positivity, harmony, adaptability. They're very much focused on people first, right? How is a decision that we make in the business going to impact the team? Who's going to get hurt feelings because of this decision that we made? How do we think about who on the team is really good at certain activities, maybe individualization talent, to be able to accomplish our goals in the best way possible? So they're thinking about the people first. And then the strategic thinking domain, I actually like to think about this as almost having a slash between those two words. So part of that domain is really strategic, kind of big picture, strategic, futuristic ideation. How do we think about the future and visioning and kind of big ideas as those creative thinkers? But then if you put a slash between strategic and thinking, the rest of those talents in the domain are a little bit more about that depth of mental activity, that deep thinking. So analytical, learner, input, intellection, all those talents that really enjoy research and data and, and thinking through the right way to approach a situation by the process of thinking about it. And so those folks tend to need a little bit more time to plan, to prepare, to execute because they're busy doing research. They're busy looking at the data. Um, they're busy thinking about what the right strategy is and how we can avoid obstacles in the future. And so I think it's important to note that one individual leader shouldn't be expected necessarily to have all four domains represented. Um, in my experience, it's about 20% of the population has something in all four. So it's not super common. And honestly, even when they do have something in all four, they don't operate equally. So the goal is not to be sort of well-rounded. The goal is to say, in what domains am I most strong? And how does that inform the way that I get work done and where I'm natural, naturally suited to approach things? And how might that be different than sort of a colleague or another team member who has talents in other areas that maybe we can complement each other? So to me, the, the four domains is really much less valuable on an individual basis and more valuable when I look at a team. Because what I often do in my consulting practice is really take a look at a team profile. So I'll do an analysis of what are the most common themes within the team itself, if you've got 10 or 15 people, and how do we cluster that or apply the four domains framework to those themes to say, wow, this group is really dominant and achiever and responsibility in the executing domain and also really dominant on the strategic futuristic side. But maybe there's not as much in the influencing domain, which is pretty common. And so how are we thinking about cross-functional capabilities with other teams? It doesn't even maybe occur to us to go outside of our own team and tell everybody else what we're doing because we're so focused on our own zone getting stuff done. So I think really helping teams understand sort of group profile can really help us to kind of take some specific and intentional steps to shore up any of those areas that might be natural blind spots. That's, that's so great. I'm, we're just about out of time. And I wanted to ask you, how can, can someone figure out what their strengths are without an assessment or should they go get one? How would they do that? Yeah, great, great question. We certainly can get some clues as to what someone's really great at without an assessment. I mean, I'm obviously, I'm, I'm biased. I always think an assessment gives you the highest level of clarity. But even in the interim, until you get a chance to, to go through something like StrengthsFinder or, or some other assessment, I think just asking a few targeted questions is really a great way to get to that. So if I am coaching a leader to identify some of the talents and strengths of their team members, I might ask them to have a little bit of an interview and ask them questions like, what really energizes you about your work, right? What are the parts of your role that you find uh, most exciting, that you look forward to doing the most? And then on the flip side, what are the things that you tend to avoid or procrastinate on? What are the aspects of your role that perhaps drain energy from you? Um, and how do we think about mitigating those a little bit? Um, and, and maybe even looking more at patterns over time. 
You know, as you think about all the different careers or jobs that you've had in your career, how can you identify some consistent patterns of, of approaches that you've employed that have you found have been really successful for you? And so it's really looking at those consistent patterns of behavior. And then the second thing I would say is uh, just observe. Be a really great sort of student of human nature and watch your team and identify what are they good at? What do they execute really quickly or effortlessly? That just seems to come natural to them. Um, if you're even a reasonably intuitive person, a lot of those things should, should become pretty clear. And of course, StrengthsFinder is just a way to kind of validate that what your initial instincts were, uh, were either right or wrong. So I think there's value in, in doing kind of the um, initial version of asking those questions to get to that person's strengths. Great. Is there any last message you'd like to leave the women who've been listening to this program? And we do have men too. Yes. I mean, absolutely. I think, you know, ask yourself, you know, as you reflect on a day where you are really just feeling like you're in the zone, um, we all have those days where we just feel like we're killing it, right? Like I just had a great day and I'm really kind of buzzing with energy. I encourage my clients to really reflect on what are you doing that day um, and almost kind of keep a little strengths journal to kind of tally up what are the activities where I feel like time just flies by effortlessly. And then also keep track of those moments where you just feel like, gosh, I'm so mentally and physically exhausted. I really hope I don't have to replicate that day for a long time and start to keep track of those things because the more that we can spend time in our areas of strength, the more successful we'll be, the more fulfilled we'll be in our career, and ultimately the, the greater impact that we have on others around us. So yes. good luck, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much, Erin. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. My pleasure. It's been good to be with you. Thanks so much. Would you like to work smarter instead of harder? Are you afraid to speak up? Do you feel like you're capable of more than you're actually doing now? Well, over the last 30 years, I've realized that women need certain skills in business to level the playing field. Outstanding women leaders advance their leadership skills and careers by having great confidence, excellent communication skills, and the ability to develop trusted relationships and influence. That's why these are some of the top topics I speak about at conferences and with organizations I consult with. I have received great feedback from women whose businesses and leadership skills have accelerated using my unique methods. It is also why I've created a special online live workshop with me to make it easier and less expensive for women to develop these important skills. This powerful, fun-filled, interactive seven-week course, Elevate Your Leadership Capacity, will teach you key leadership skills using cutting-edge techniques. If you are committed to developing yourself improving your confidence and leadership skills, and quickly increasing your impact and influence, and want to be considered part of the next small group, please contact me at sabrina at sabrinabrom.com or go to www.womensleadershipsuccess.com and submit your email in the information box in the top upper right-hand side of the page. Don't miss out! This may be one of the last times I actually participate live in this powerful leadership program, developed especially for women like you. Thank you for joining your host, Sabrina Brahm, on another Women's Leadership Podcast. If you have questions or comments, you can email her at sabrina at sabrinabrahm.com. Since 1989, Sabrina and her team have helped hundreds of women managers, business leaders, and entrepreneurs with valuable trainings, articles, books, and executive coaching. For additional tips, interviews, and free access to Great Leaders Today mini-course, visit www.womensleadershipsuccess.com.